Katrin Meissner. I'm an ARC Future Fellow. I'm an Associate Professor at the Climate Change Research Center at the University of New South Wales. My research is about climate feedbacks. And I work with Earth System Climate Models. So these are models that have pretty much all the big components of the climate system, ocean, atmosphere, vegetation, sediments, ice, biogeochemical cycles. And I'm interested in feedbacks um, in the climate system and thresholds. So basically, if we tweak the system a little bit, um, how is it going to react? It's not always linear. It's a little bit like if you have a glass of water at the edge of the table, you can push it a little. You can push it a little at one point, it will fall down. So I'm trying to understand if we have these feedback thresholds in the climate system. My research is about past, present and future. And in the past, I have focused mostly on abrupt change. And I'm especially interested, actually, in, in abrupt warming events. So we know in the history from our reconstructions that climate has changed quite dramatically and has warmed up quite dramatically in the past. And that was even without any humans being around, or at least not actively um, interacting with the system. So I'm trying to understand what happened during these um, episodes and if this is likely to happen in the future again on top of what we are doing right now to the climate system. Um, so I would say most of my research um, was actually about the last ice age, the deglaciation, then present and future. But I have several studies that go further back, so when dinosaurs were around or even further back. Uh, the last deglaciation happened over the last, um, started about 20,000 years ago. That's when it was really cold. We had lots of big ice sheets in North America, uh, mainly in the Northern Hemisphere, actually. And um, then it warmed up and this ice warmed, but it didn't do this very smoothly. Like it, it went back and forth and we had big warming and cooling <laughs> episodes in there. And I think people, um, uh, I'm not sure on the exact dates, but it was probably done within 10,000 years ago. So the, the Gleed glaciation happened between 20 and 10,000 years ago, roughly. I think for me, the key lessons are that um, CO2 in the atmosphere didn't, it, it did um, increase over this time, but it didn't increase linearly. And there were periods of time where CO2 really increased quite rapidly and then stopped again and increased rapidly again. And I don't think we really understand where this carbon came from. Um, so this is one of our main research areas right now in, in my field, and there's lots of people working on it. Um, and how the whole system was interconnected. Like why, why did this carbon come out at that point? And did it come from the land or from the ocean? Probably from the ocean. Why, where? These are still open questions. And I think for me, um, a nice or maybe a little bit scary result is that our models can't capture the, sen the, the sensitivity of the system. Um, our models don't seem to be responsive enough. They seem to be too stable. And that, of course, if that's true, is a problem for our future projections. Um, if we can't get the past variability and the past warming events right, how are we going to get the future right? Are we not underestimating? some of the effects that are going to happen. The past tells us that um, the climate certainly does not react linearly to any changes from outside. So for the deglaciation, when all these glaciers um, started to melt, we know that was um, probably triggered by solar insulation during the summer in the Northern Hemisphere, which started the whole melting process. But then there were lots of other feedback that kicked in and enforce this um, first trigger and we know that these feedbacks um, were not linear. So one, one of the major misconceptions right now um, is that people argue that the climate has changed in the past and, and therefore what we see now might just be part of natural variability. Um, this is not true. Um, the changes we see now are so fast and so um, enormous that, that doesn't compare to anything we actually have in the records, certainly not in the last um, two million years, but also if you go very far back, um, there was maybe one event 55 million years ago, which um, was associated to a, a big increase in CO2, but even that happened at a much slower rate than the rate we are changing the climate right now. So um, looking into the past can tell us a little bit 
about how the system might react if we push it, but the way we push it right now is out of context of anything we can see in our records um, during the quaternary. So basically, if you, look, if you look at the plots, I mean, if you just look at the um, temperature reconstructions of CO2 plots, you see all the variability. And like he, you have ice here, and now you have ice stone here, and interglacials here, and it goes like this, and today we're up here. So we are completely out of this range of variability. I no guess. model is perfect, so you really need to dis define the problem you want to look at first and then you can decide which model would be useful. It's a little bit like you're going to the doctor and they think you might have a tumor. There's different ways of analyzing and, and visually visualizing what's happening in your body and the doctor will tell you, oh, we need this kind of scan or this kind of, and that's a little bit what we do with the model. So it's a whole zoo of models. Um, they are related, but they have different um, strengths and weaknesses. Mm. So all these models um, share lots of characteristics and of course the physics of the models are very very similar because they're all based on, on the fundamental same equations of fluid dynamics. <laughs> it's the same equation that we knew that equation since hundreds of years. They are based on the same thermodynamic equations. Um, so what differs in the model is the resolution. Basically a model is, is like if you would construct your world out of little Lego blocks and it's basically the size of the Lego blocks. So you can buy a really expensive Lego Star Wars ship. My son has those. They're very big, expensive, takes the poor parents two days to build them, and they have lots of detail. Or you can buy a little car for a three-year-old, which doesn't have that much detail, but it's made out of big, big blocks. And in a way, that's one of the differences between these models. Another difference is how much biogeochemistry they have in there. That's a whole new component. Um, uh, on how much different components they have in there. Some have really sophisticated ice models, others might not have ice models. Some have sediment models, others might not have that. But the fundamental equations for fluid dynamics are the same. Uh, okay, I started off as an engineer. Oh, wow. Yeah, and um, during my studies, I realized that I, w I knew that before I liked the ocean. So I did a general gen engineering degree in France, but with the option ocean. And I really wanted to work in Africa. The only way to do that easily was um, to work for an oil company, which I did. Um, I earned a lot of money for a few months and I hated it. Um, so I went back to school and actually did a master's in um, physical oceanography and a, a, a PhD also in physics and physical oceanography because I realized I wanted to work for the ocean but not exploit the, the ocean. Um, so that's how I started. Um, I guess I got into it because I love the ocean. So I really went in through the oceanography, but yeah, by starting as an engineer and then doing a PhD in physics. Yeah, so, so I have had people um, commenting on the fact that I might be biased in my opinion about climate change because of course I would like to have climate change problems in the headlines because that's where my salary is coming from. Uh, my response to this is that um, honestly I think we know enough about climate change. The physics are solved. Um, I would be much happier not to have any money into climate research but put the money into impact research and into um, renewable energy research. The physics of climate change are settled. We, we know what's happening. We don't know all the details, small details, regional forecast. I mean, there's always things you can research, but the science is actually settled. So I would be very um, glad to actually shift a little bit our attention here and go into what are we going to do about it. The whole um, communication of climate science, I think, is a very difficult question. And from what I, but I'm, I'm not a social scientist or a psychologist, but from what I understand is, um, I, I, it always used to puzzle me that why, why wouldn't people believe climate scientists, although they do believe their doctors. Like if they are very sick, they wouldn't go to see their plumber or their gardener and, and take their advice they would actually go to see a doctor. So where, why is it that climate scientists, in some, for some people, don't seem to be respected or have a respected opinion? 
And from what I've read is that, um, and I think that's human psychology, if you have made up your mind, you make up your mind not always based on specialists, you make up your mind of what your friends say or what somebody says who, who you're respecting a lot. And once you've made up your mind, it's really hard to get you out of there, even with arguments. So I don't quite know how to better communicate. I think what's really important is to communicate to children, communicate to schools, communicate in easy words. We are not very good at this. And um, yeah, in, in, in simple language, and not, maybe not simple, but in, in, um, in not a specialized language. And um, yeah, never get frustrated, although it is very frustrating. Look, um, I, yes, I, I have uh, sometimes with taxi drivers or somebody I sit beside in, in a plane, right? And when I realize, sometimes you, you, you can feel it just from the conversation you have with them. And then when these guys ask me what my job is, I usually just say I work at the university, I'm secretary. I, I just don't go into it because I, and probably that's wrong, probably I should, but this, I, I have had these discussions with random people and they usually don't accomplish anything. If um, these people are people I'm actually interacting socially with, like um, other parents from school or um, my dentist, or some, then, then I actually go into an argument and, and tell them what I think and what my um, opinion is based on, which facts it is based on. But random people in the street, no. In a short way, I, I can say, look, there's a fundamental relationship between CO2 and temperature. And you can see this in, from different ways. You can just um, do the fundamental physics of thermodynamics and, and, and radiative physics that CO2 will absorb long wave radiation and re-radiate it. If you don't like this approach, you can look at CO2 um, um, records from ice cores and temperature records, and you see how nicely they correlate. If you still don't like this approach, you can also just look at um, present day data actually and see how they, and this is satellite data, so we can trust this and how well they actually correlate. So I think we can go there from different directions and the conclusion is always the same, is CO2 and temperature are really tightly um, correlated and we have put lots of CO2 in the atmosphere. So the story is very easy. Um, we should stop putting CO2 in the atmosphere. Mm. And we should probably try even to find a way to get the CO2 out of the atmosphere again. Yeah. So I'm um, in your recording, are yeah. you? Oh. So, oh, no. <laughs> I won't, we won't. <laughs> That we may put in somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> That'll go in the trailer. <laughs>